Good morning, everybody. Thank God for another beautiful day. And uh, let's bow our heads for prayer. Our most gracious and loving Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us life and health and strength to serve you another day. We ask you to help us to attempt great things for you and help us to accept great things from you. We, we know that we are living in the last days. We expect, we ask you to help us to know the urgency of the times we live in. Help us to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. We ask these blessings in your dear name. Amen. So dear to my heart is the promise of God, a home with the pure and blessed, where earth's weary pilgrims, strangers here below, will find their eternal rest. I'm homesick for heaven, seems I cannot wait, yearning to enter Zion's pearly gate. There never a heartache, never a care, I long for my home over there. Tis Eden, fair Eden, I long to be home, where naught can despoil that's fair, where saints of all ages Hold communion sweet, the glories of heaven share. I'm homesick for heaven, seems I cannot wait. Yearning to enter Zion's pearly gate. There never a heartache, never a care. I long for my home. Chiefest of all is the thought that enthralls that I shall behold my King. Rejoice in His presence, revel in His grace, and ever His praises sing. I cannot wait, yearning to enter Zion's pearly gate. There never a heartache, never a care. I long for my home over there. Oh. ASI family. Have you been blessed so far? I want to hear a big amen. 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 Well, you know, those who have been coming to the prayer chapel here at ASI have been blessed as well. And I have here Michael Belknap and Jason Kunai. And Michael, what was your main reason for coming to ASI? Uh, one of the main reasons actually was to come to the prayer chapel this year. So how did you hear about the prayer chapel? Last year at the convention in Sacramento was my first year at ASI, and I went to the uh, chapel there. Praise the Lord. And you know he came all the way from Niagara Falls, New York, to come to the prayer chapel. Tell me why. Well, the reality is I guess I have needs personally and battles that I face, and uh, there's decisions that need to be made at this time in history. And when I re was remembering about the prayer chapel, I just felt impressed. Hey, this is an opportunity. This is the time God told us that he's going to pour out his Holy Spirit, and he'd do it at meetings like such as this in prayer. So I thought this is the place to come. You know, that reminds me of this quote from Selected Messages. A revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. That's very exciting. We're glad you're here. And this is your first 
experience with United Prayer, right, Jason? Tell me, how yep. did it go? Um, I felt just really blessed. Um, and I, like Michael, I had questions also just uh, wondering where the Lord wants to use me in, in future ministry in Niagara Falls. And so it was a perfect opportunity to come. Praise the Lord. And you know, um, you shared with me that you've been Christian for seven years. And what else can you tell me about the United Prayer Room? Have you learned anything about prayer in there? Yeah, actually, um, it's, it's really easy for me to open up my Bible and just read it uh, in the morning or whenever. Um, but for me to pray, it's really hard sometimes, uh, personally. And so it's just a tremendous blessing to be around people in, in this prayer chapel that they pray. And the format is really easy. And um, it's just like, you know, acts, like adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. And um, it's just making new pathways in my brain because I'm a new Christian. And you don't always get taught how to pray. And uh, it's just a tremendous blessing. Praise the Lord. And if any of you are struggling with your personal prayer life and you want that encouragement, I urge you to come to the prayer chapel and pray with others. And also, if you're um, watching on TV and you would love this, you can go to armybibleclamp.com, and we have a, a prayer manual that shows you exactly how to do this. It's very exciting. So how many hours were you in the prayer room yesterday? Uh, I believe between four and five. So, you know, this might amaze you, but if you think about Jesus, he prayed all night long, didn't he? And the um, apostles, they came together, and they prayed for days. And, you know, in this time, we really need prayer, don't we? So what I'd like to encourage you to do right now is um, to come to the prayer chapel. Think about your schedule today. When could you come? And it's open from 6.15 to a.m. to 10 p.m. at night. And it's located right down at the end of this hall if you walk past the registration table. And they start a new session at the top of every hour. And so turn to the person next to you and ask them, what time do you plan to be in the prayer chapel today? And then tell them it's time to pray. Thank you. We have something very exciting to, to talk to you guys about. How many of you love technology? All right. How many of you have smartphones out there? All right. How many of you have Apple smartphones out there? All right, we got a lot of Apple users. Well, today I'm here with Andrew Jones. He is the um, app developer that we've developed an app for uh, ASI, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about that. Andrew, tell us a little bit about what this app is capable of, and uh, you know, why did we develop this app for ASI? Well, um, the app we decided to do an app that will let you stay connected throughout the year with ASI and be very useful during the convention. And so, if we go to our first uh, slide here you'll notice that uh, when you first open up the app, um, you will see that we have a, like a Twitter feed at the bottom, so you can keep in contact with the latest updates. For example, when I got to my hotel uh, a couple days ago, I noticed that 3ABN is being shown on a certain channel in my hotel, and it was, it's mentioned that in the Twitter feed, so I was able to go to that channel and watch 3ABN. Also, across the top of this convention uh, screen, we give you different functionalities like um, you can see the uh, exhibitors, speakers, and then we have, of course, the schedule. So what, if you have the schedule, what's different about that as opposed to, like, say, the program that we have? I mean, what, 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 what kind of features offer there? Well, if you notice on the screen here that the schedule gives you such things as you can filter um, by what's going on right now. So you can, if it's Thursday, you don't have to look at uh, Wednesday's um, meetings. And you can, of course, um, favorite an item. So if you want to build your own schedule, you can uh, drill down, favorite the item, and then you notice on the screen we have, um, uh, if you go back one more, uh, we do have example of a favorited list of all the items on your schedule. And then, of course, you can then drill down and find out where these meetings are at. And, um, and so like we have the location, the times, and the meetings, the session information. So if I want to find out what a session is, what about what about the speakers and, and some information about them? Is, is that available on the app? Yes, it is. Um, 
We do have a whole uh, speaker section where you can search by the speaker's name. And we, for example, this screen shows uh, Neil Nedley, and it shows like what sessions he's speaking at. You can uh, look up his bio um, and go, even go to his website. For example, I was at the ASI booth a couple, um, yesterday, and this lady was looking for contact information for one of the speakers. And uh, she assumed I had it, so I immediately knew that we had it in the, uh, the app. So I looked it up. I was able to give her the website for the speaker, and of course, she appreciated that. Um, but not only, of course, we have speakers, but we also have the exhibitors. And the app will give you information where all the exhibits are at and their booth number. So this app will tell you where the booths are, how to get to the booths. We're not that advanced, but okay. it gives you a list of everything um, that's out there and the booth number. So, so let's say if I wanted to go to a particular booth, it'll tell me exactly where to get to it. And, yeah. and actually, uh, if I want to know more about the exhibitor that's there, is there, is there more information than just the booth? Yes, uh, you can actually click on, um, you can tap on the exhibitor's name. And if they have a website in our system, it'll pull up their website. So you could then preview their website. So that lets us stay more in touch with uh, all the people that are involved with ASI a little bit more, gives you information at your fingertips, and uh, allows you to kind of filter through it and uh, have a lot of options. Yeah, just uh, as you walk around, you don't have to, if you lost your program guide or forgot at the hotel, then you can use your phone. Nice. Uh, so, but beside the convention, of course, throughout the year, if you want to stay in contact with ASI, we have a whole section just for that. And so next, um, we have this screen just for projects. And you can see where you can search by all the projects that ASI's um, donations are going to, and you can pull up information on them. So here's an example of Little Light's um, project. <laughs> and um, it has the information, the amount, and you can even view the Little Light website. Nice, and see what, where, where the money's going, what they're yeah. using it for, and uh, get a little bit more detail on that. That's correct. Nice. Um, and of course, moving on, we also have a bunch more information, like you can do online donations. So if you're on the road or just on your phone and you uh, need to renew your membership or donate to ASI, you feel like donating at that moment, it will link you to the PayPal online um, on pay, uh, ASI's website. And of course, you can call or email ASI directly from the app. Now, Andrew, what about some of the past media that's, that's been captured here at ASI? What if I want to listen to some of the MP3s or watch some of the videos? Is that capable on this app? Yes, we do have a whole media section. Um, and right now, we just have the YouTube uh, channel of ASI up. But in the future, we will have um, all the past conventions, including the current one, all the media. So if I'm in my car and I want to listen to one of the ASI meetings, I can actually do that. That's correct. Um, we will have different formats, so depending on your connection, you'll either get an audio only or you'll actually have high quality video. If well, you have that's awesome. When yeah. is this app going to be available? Well, it, we've submitted it to Apple and we're just um, praying that they'll uh, approve it with <laughs> within the next couple hours. <laughs> Well, as so. soon as it's available, we will let you guys all know. We'll have a little announcement. We'll put it out on Facebook and Twitter, and you guys can uh, utilize this awesome tool. And uh, thank you, Andrew, for developing this app. Good morning, ASI family. Our offerings in motion, in action, and in motion, continue this morning. With me is Daryl Thompson. He's from the LNG White Estate. And uh, Daryl, tell us a little bit about what your role is at the LNG White Estate. Thank you, Debbie. I'm Daryl, and I'm the assistant director there at the LNG White Estate, and I take care of all our electronic projects, our website and our apps. Now, um, ASI provided some funding for the LNG White Estate. Uh, for what reason and what kind of progress has been made to date? Thank you. Uh, we had nine languages last year, and I stood up the front and spoke to you people and, and said, you know, we'd love to be able to add more languages. And with the generous donations of ASI members, we were able this year to add 200 books and 45 languages. Wow, that's exciting. Now, um, help us understand, what, is, what does that mean? So adding the number of books in specific languages on the website available for people to access? Yes, at egwwritings.org, um, you can go there. And when you go there, you'll notice that if you go to the library and you scroll down in the library, you will see language by language by language. We have one, two, three, up to um, 420 English, but 99 Portuguese, so 78 Spanish, and then the, li the list goes on down from there. Well, that sounds... Uh, how many people do you have working on this? Uh, Is it just you? <laughs> 
I'm just the team director. Uh, if you can imagine, let, let's, let's think. Uh, with those nine languages, uh, we spent half a million dollars and three years to get those nine languages up there. Wow. And we released that at general conference session. In the last year, you know, we had a generous donation of $200,000 for ASI. And we knew that to be able to get those books up there in multiple languages, not the common languages, how are we going to get people to help us? But luckily there is the internet. And like you might have heard of, you know, Monster, which is, goes out and helps get jobs. You know, we use VWorker. And we're able to get lots of people to help us out. So we had over 100 people working on this. We had three team leaders and all had their different specialties, all from people that were scanning books at Andrews, students, uh, people at the wider state, people in Germany, um, in um, Brazil, in China, in Philippines, in India, scattered across the globe. We had teams of people working on digitizing these books and making them available. Wow, so this has truly been a worldwide effort. Exactly. Um, can you tell me what kind of um, impact have you seen? Has anyone noticed that their language is on the website? Yes, lots of people used to write into us and say, okay, you know, you have this language, you have English, um, Spanish, Chinese, Russian, Italian, um, Portuguese, but where's my language? You know, uh, why, can't, why can't you put our language up there? And so, you know, I'd write back and say, what's coming, you know? Uh, we also have a website, partner.egwwritings.org, and we'd send them to there to help make contributions. If they saw a book that they would like to help put up on the website, they could sponsor that book, and then we would make it available. Now, we just heard prior to us coming out, um, apps and um, all of these things that help us. You can tell I'm not okay. a real, okay. Right. Yes, actually, I was helping Debbie yesterday get our app on her smartphone. If you have a smartphone, just like the previous people were talking to you about it, um, we have an Android app, we have a BlackBerry Playbook app, we have a Nook Color and Tablet app, we have a Kindle Fire app, we have an iPhone app, we have an iPad app, and if you have the new you know, Google Nexus 7, it works wonderfully on that as well. So we have those, all those apps available. With EGW Writings, you just go to their app store, type in EGW Writings, and you'll find the app there. And those apps just simply help you to access uh, the information from the website mm -hmm. in a more user-friendly way on your phone. Right. Well, the great thing about apps is like, you don't always carry a laptop computer around with you. But most people do carry a smartphone. And it's amazing in the last year how we get people write in and say, you know, the spirit of prophecy has meant so much to me because wherever I go, I have it with me. I can pull it out. I can read it. I can tweet it to my friends. I can Facebook it. Or I can be in the doctor's office and I can read it. Or I can be driving in my car and stream it from the website and listen to it. At a stop slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not you, while you, driving. No, but, they're, you know, it's an audio book. Right. So they're listening oh, to it. Oh. Yes. So they're listening ah, to the audio, not reading okay. it. <laughs> All right, that, that's fantastic. That's really, so what's next? How many more languages still have to be uploaded? Well, we have actually scanned uh, over 500 books um, that we have completed, our students there at Andrews, that worked on our team. Um, but we don't have the funds yet to be able to make them available because there's a big process in moving from a scanned page to make it available on our website. Um, so ASI this year has also promised to help us with some more money. So the partnership uh, of ASI and other people is much appreciated and will make it you know, available. We hope to get the rest of those you know, 300 books up there. And there's, there will be, you know, we have in Steps to Christ 110 languages available in Steps to Christ and we haven't quite yet got 30. So you know, there's 80 languages yet that we can still add in Steps to Christ. Oh, Daryl, thank you so much for what you and your team at the E.G. White Estate is doing so that the world, our world family can have access to these marvelous truths. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you where's so your booth? So if people want you to okay. help them like you helped me, where okay. can they come? Uh, booth 214, or you can visit uh, ellenwhite.org, or the writings website is egwwritings.org. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Daryl. Coming to the podium is um, Molly Steenson. Uh, Molly is, works with uh, 3ABN, and I'm going to ask Molly to share a little bit about what her role is uh, at this wonderful organization. How many of you are familiar with 3ABN? All right, that's what I like to hear. I'm the vice president, that's just a title, but I'm the general manager, guys, that's a job description. <laughs> and uh, so that's what I do at 3ABN. And with the offerings that ASI, uh, the ASI family and others have provided for 3ABN, what kind of impact has that been able to make for the expansion of the gospel? 
through the years, and we've been a part of ASI now for many years, any time we start to launch out to do something uh, on a, a, a worldwide scale, ASI has always been there both to encourage us uh, with their prayers, with their love, and with their financial support. And uh, one of the areas that they have helped us in through the years is with our low-power television stations. Do any of you live in an area where we have a low-power television station? We have 127 here in the United States. Now, what a low-power television station is, it's a station in your area, our, uh, a downlink tower, where we can broadcast the signal from 3 ABN. And the, although they're low-power, Debbie, they are far-reaching. They will reach as much as from 10 to 30 miles all around in your area and you don't have to have anything other than uh, little rabbit ears or the little loop to receive it in your area so they are some of the most productive uh, tools of evangelism that we have here in these United States. Wow, that's pretty incredible. Now, I, I understand even with the low-powered, there's a way that the information is transmitted. So explain this analog to digital thing. Well, a few years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, the FCC told us that we had to um, upgrade our digital or our analog stations from analog to digital. Now, I don't understand a whole lot about this. Moses Primo is our genius in this area, but it has to do with bandwidth. And so in, with an analog station, we're only able to broadcast one channel into an area at a time. And of course, that was 3ABN English. But when we uh, upgrade our uh, analog stations from analog to digital, then we're able to broadcast into an area 3ABN English, 3ABN Latino, Dare to Dream, as well as the proclaimed television stations, as well as we're able to broadcast on this same bandwidth. Now, when it's, uh, when it's analog, it's this much bandwidth. When you uh, upgrade it to digital, they compress the bandwidth, and you're able to broadcast more channels into an area, not just those four television channels, but also radio channels we're able to broadcast into these areas, these 127 areas area strategically placed throughout the United States, 3ABN English Radio, 3ABN Latino Radio, as well as Radio 74. So we continue to be able to stretch the reach of the gospel and to minister to more people when we upgrade our uh, downlinks or our uh, low power stations from analog to digital. So that's what we are doing now. And we have 127, I think I mentioned that. It cost about $40,000 per channel to upgrade it uh, from analog to digital. Now, if you, how many of you can do the math very quickly? $40,000 times 127, that's about $5 million. Well, when we realized this a few years ago, that was overwhelming. The, the, the 3ABN operates from month to month. When we tell you, and you've heard Danny and Jim say this so often, that we have no money in the coffers, do you know what that means? that we have no money in the coffers, but you know what happens every month? Our God supplies all of our need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Well, in the past two years, we have been able through the grace and mercy of God to upgrade 54 of those channels from, uh, from analog to digital. That is about $2 million. We have no idea where the money came from, but God has provided. We only have 73 more to upgrade, and that's about $3 million. But God's provided so far, so we've got total confidence that he's going to continue to provide. And Debbie, last year in 2011, when we, every year we come to ASI with a proposal or a request for funds to help us as we continue to stretch the reach of the gospel, to continue and, and to upgrade what we have so that it'll reach more people. And we ask them if they would help us with funds to upgrade our low power stations. And these are the stations that we ask for help for. We ask for help to upgrade the stations in Lincoln, Nebraska, in Collegedale, Tennessee, and in Huntsville, Alabama. Now somebody tell me, what do those three cities have in common? 
What do, what do, it's our universities and colleges are in that area, aren't they? We feel like, felt like it was very important that we upgrade, that they be some of the first that we upgrade so that our college students, those that have left home and that are now away from home, away from their home church, they'll be able to have access to the gospel 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it doesn't matter what they're, uh, if, if they're Spanish speaking, if, if, if they're from the inner cities, there's always that opportunity and possibility to receive the gospel. Molly, we want to thank you as ASI for everything that 3ABN has done for the expansion of the gospel and also to be able to air ASI conventions so others can join in with these marvelous testimonies, music, messages. Thank you to 3ABN and thank you ASI family. Well, thank you so much for all that you do for 3ABN. Thank you, Molly. Our next interview, our offering in action, has to do with the DVD project. Oh, and I have a guest that I haven't seen for a while. Um, Ruth Chenoweth is a veteran ASI member, and she's going to introduce our guest for, for our interview. I'm so pleased to introduce Eddie Lawson from Jamaica. He's a businessman in Jamaica. I met him and his lovely wife in Guatemala City. The, the Inter-American Division ASI convention there in 2002, that's 10 years ago. And I had with me at that time the most anticipated, the New Beginnings, a copy of the New Beginnings with me. So we showed it around there while we were there at the convention. And every time I look around, there was uh, Eddie right next to us. So at the end of the convention, I said to my son, let's leave this with Eddie, this copy that we have with us. And so I presented, we presented this to Eddie, and we said, Eddie, if you don't use, we're going to present this to you to, to take with you. If you don't use it in a certain time, you have to return it to us. Now, I want you to listen to that journey, uh, that 10-year journey of Eddie Lawson. Thank you very much, Ruth. So, Eddie, you were given um, a DVD, a New Beginnings Sermons, with 26 sermons culturalized for every, parts of, for every part of the world. What did you do with that, with that charge given by the Chenoweths? I immediately, when I got back to Jamaica, I seek out and found a lay preacher because I was warned that it must be used by a lay preacher. And so I found one and uh, I gave it to him. So you, you found it and you gave it to him and you set up these meetings. Yes, um, I did. And, well, who bankrolled the meetings? I operated three businesses at the time, a hardware, a pharmacy, and we were building a shopping center. And so I uh, used my personal resources to finance these crusades. Okay, wonderful. And um, so I understand, so what, what happened over the last 10 years? How many uh, meetings have been held? How many people baptized? What kind of impact has it made, this one gift of a DVD? Well, I've lost count of how many meetings, but one thing I can say, we have been to 14, to 13 or 14 parishes in Jamaica. And we took it to the Cayman Islands twice and one time to the Bahamas. Wow, and um, I think you told me oh, upwards of 5,000 baptisms yes, had the, resulted? the last count, which was about last week, we were over 5,000. Praise the Lord. And even as we speak, there is a crusade going on using the new DVD, the new, the new beginning. Yes. Oh, the DVD. that is wonderful. Now, um, I, I want to hasten to say mm -hmm. that uh, this this charge that you responded to and your commitment and passion to get the word out and to use it has not come without some personal sacrifice. No, not at all. Whenever, so, yes. Whenever one um, steps out to do work for Christ, the devil is not pleased. And I experienced that personally. Mm -hmm. um, my business was embezzled by a co-worker and almost bankrupted. After that, after we got over that, my wife came down with a mystery illness, and she was paralyzed for two weeks. 
and uh, the doctors wanted to go in her spine. They eventually told us she had a spinal aneurysm, and they wanted to go in, and I said no. So this sp spinal aneurysm, for those who are not medically inclined, it's a swelling of the blood vessel close to the spine. Right, it was resting on the spinal ah, cord. on the spinal cord. Right. So that so pressure they wanted lost, to relieve. Okay. Right, she lost okay. all movements from here from, go down. Okay. And so we called upon God. Oh. On, on the Sabbath, we had a, a special intercessor, a prayer at my home, because I couldn't go to church that I was so down. And the church brothers and sisters came to my home, and we had an intercessor a prayer. At the time we had the prayer, Dawn was, we flew her out to Miami at the Jackson Memorial to get a second opinion. And so we had that intercessor a prayer that day. And the Sunday morning, her, her mom, who was with her, called me to say that she just miraculously got up out of the bed and walked and took a shower something that she couldn't do in the, for the past two weeks. Praise God. God. Be praise God. And um, the devil also touched your person and afflicted you with cancer. Yes. You were diagnosed in, with myeloma. In, in 2006, I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. I, I flew out again to Miami, and I was told I had 18 months to live. And how long ago was that? In 2006, that's six years. Six years. No. So the doctors can say what they wish, That's but right. God has the final word. Right. Now, before all of this happened, there was something that was even more tragic that occurred in your family. Yes. The second week of the first crusade, we had a six-weeks-old daughter. And the night when the crusade started, she, she got sick, and we had to rush her to the doctor. And she was admitted. And for the ensuing two weeks, I was between the hospital and the crusade, because I was managing the, the, the crusade. And at the end of the second week, my daughter died. So I remember meeting um, Eddie and his wife Dawn, and I was struck by their testimony. Dawn was still very much grief-stricken by the loss of little Samantha. Yes. And uh, their business is named at, is Sam's, S-A-M-M-S. Uh, after Samantha. Yeah. And you went through a lot of struggle. I mean, your wife needed you, Sam was sick, and the crusade was going on, and what, was, what must have that been for you? You like, know, I am convinced that the devil wanted me to pull the plug on the crusade. He wanted me to cut off financing because I was in the middle of doing something for God. And to, to us, God did not save our daughter, and, and he could. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was... It, it was very confusing to say it, you know? Well, you know, why did God allow our daughter to die? We're keeping a crusade. But, you know, I, I, I am convinced, and my mantra is, God must be praised in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. And that kept me, you know? I was very torn between going to the hospital, staying with my wife, coming back to see that the crusade was was, um, you know, going on. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that crusade, we baptized 129 people. Praise the Lord. You know? Wow. So, and there was something, there was a message, uh, a reminder that you gave to your wife mm -hmm. when she was pleading for your support. And she was just saying, you know, how could you do this? And, and our little girl is, it needs us so much. What did you tell her to remind her what the priority was? <laughs> yes, I, I, I told her, that, honey, yes, it, it's hard, but God is bigger than all of this. No matter what we're going through, we lost our daughter. Yes, it hurts, right? But we must not be sidetracked of the bigger picture. To in, no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, we must always put God first. And God be praised if you're faithful. Because you'll be faithful, you will see Sam again. And Great. Sam will be given to your arms, and you'll be able to watch her grow in eternity. That, that, that was fundamental, too. That's what I said. Make sure that you and I live a life so that one day we will be reunited with Samantha. Mm -hmm. 
Eddie, yeah. thank you so much for your faithfulness and your courage and your, uh, your, your demonstration to us what can happen when you put all, literally all, in the hands of God. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Our speaker for this session is Pastor Steve Wolberg. He's the speaker director for White Horse Media. And uh, Pastor Steve has just an incredible ministry. He's been involved in uh, as a TV producer, as a radio host, and he's actually been a guest on more than 500 different radio and TV programs. He's been by special invitation a speaker at uh, the Pentagon and the U.S. Senate, and I'm just really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. I asked Pastor Steve how things were going with White Horse Media. And he said, the Lord is really blessing. In fact, he, he shared a little story that I, I just have to squeeze in in a couple seconds. He said um, that someone called him, the media recently, and said, we've been looking for a program to put on our coast-to-coast -coast live TV station, a program on Bible prophecy. They did an internet search, and they found White Horse Media's website. I believe the angels helped them to do that. And they gave them a call just out of the blue. They talked to Pastor Steve, and they said, uh, would you be interested in taking a prime time slot for the next year? And of course, they said yes. And um, a, a friend of the, of the ministry said, I'm going to sell my condo to help cover the costs. And they covered the costs, and now, from coast to coast, uh, on prime time, live TV, we're going to be able to hear Bible prophecy shared by Pastor Steve Wolberg, a program called His Voice Today. God is amazing, isn't he? How he works. Praise the Lord. So let us prepare our hearts and minds to receive the message that God has for us this morning. The ground beneath quakes as 
as its maker bows his head. Curtain torn in two, dead are raised to life, finished the victory cry. This the power of the cross, Christ became the cross Oh to see my name written in those wounds for through your suffering I am made free death is crushed to death life is mine to the cross. Thank you very much. Appreciate that song. Good morning, everyone. God is so good, and I'm so thrilled to be here. I have had a dream for a long time to share what I'm going to share with this group. This morning and today my dream has come true. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to open up to the book of Revelation, chapter 18. I will confess I've had a cold for three or four days and so my voice is not as strong as uh, it often is, but I read a promise just about 20 minutes ago that God's power is made perfect in weakness and I love that, that promise. So let's bow our heads and let's just pray. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, God, thank you so much for this group and for uh, your power and especially above all things for Jesus Christ and for the cross. And we pray that as we get into this topic of the message of the righteousness of Jesus Christ during earth's last crisis, that the Holy Spirit will be here mightily. Please, Father, uh, work through me and speak to all of our hearts and to people around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, I've got a lot to share in a short time, so I'm going to get right in. Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, is one of my favorite verses in the Bible in the book of Revelation. It's a, it's a dream, it's a vision of what God wants to do through his people and what he will do someday soon around the world. Verse 1, after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Don't you want to see that happen? The earth being lightened with God's glory. I'll tell you a little story. About five years ago, my family was living in uh, Aubrey, California, north of Fresno, and my son was about three years old, and we were up in our house looking out through the living room window off into the distance. We were living up in the hills, and we saw, it was about 8.30 at night, it was dark, but we saw on the horizon lightning flashing. A storm was approaching, and we just sat there in the living room watching the lightning getting closer and closer and closer. And finally, wham, a big bolt hit, our, hit the area, at least it hit the power somewhere, and we were in pitch black pitch darkness. And my little boy, uh, he was quite frightened, so we all got together on our couch. We grabbed our flashlights, and little Seth, he was three years old, and he said, Daddy, we need to pray. We need to pray. So we knelt down, and he prayed this prayer, a little three-year-old prayer. He said, uh, it was very short. He said, dear Jesus, he said, please turn the lights on. <laughs> that was his prayer. Dear Jesus, please turn the lights on. 
And then I still remember he opened his eyes and it was still dark. And he looked at me and he said, Daddy, it's still dark. And I said, uh, I said Seth, just give the Lord a little time to answer your prayer. Well, uh, that night we all slept in our, our bed in the bedroom, the three of us, and we were there. And um, we went to sleep and at about one o'clock in the morning, I could hear the heater up on the roof kick in. So I knew the power was back on. And at about six o'clock, Seth gets out of bed and he's feeling around in the bedroom and he whispers to me, he says, Daddy, he said, I want to play with my toys. Uh, where's the flashlight? And I knew that the heater was on, that the electricity was on. So I said to him, I just whispered, and I said, Seth, just go, just go flick on the light, flick on the switch. And so he got out of bed, went around, and he flicked the switch, and the light went on in the bedroom. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and his, his mouth just dropped open. And he said, Daddy, whoa. He said, Jesus answered my prayer. The lights are on. And uh, that just little scene just impressed me so much, and I've shared this many times. Uh, as I think about that little family experience, I think about the darkness of this world. I think about the storm that is on the horizon. I think about the, uh, the pitch blackness that is all around us morally. I think about Revelation 18, verse 1, that says an angel is going to come down from heaven and lighten the earth with its glory. Uh, and I strongly believe that one of these days, coast to coast, people are going to be saying, whoa, we have never seen light like that power like that. And that's what we need. That's the power that we need. And that's what Revelation 18.1 says. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, and he had great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. Back up a couple pages to chapter 14, Revelation 14. If you have studied Revelation uh, carefully, which I know many of you have, you know that the angel that comes down in Revelation 18.1 is often referred to as the fourth angel. And he comes down to basically join the three angels' messages, especially the third angel's message during the time of Earth's last crisis. And that's what the three angels' messages are all about, pointing us to a final period. Uh, Revelation 14 verse 9 warns about the beast. It warns about the image of the beast. Verse 9 and 10 warns about the mark of the beast. And then verse 12 talks about the people who don't get the mark and who are ready for the second coming. Revelation 14, 12, let's read it. Let's read it together. 14, 12, the Bible says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Right. Uh, I strongly believe that just like John 3.16 is the most famous verse in the Bible, I believe that this verse is soon going to become the most quoted verse all over the planet. 14.12, people are going to be saying this verse on the radio, on television, it's going to be quoted on the internet, it's going to be all over the planet, people are going to be hearing it, they're going to be reading it on their cell phones, on their apps on their Bible programs. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus during the final crisis. Now what I'm going to share with you right now as we get in, uh, I'm going to try in a very simple way to show you how during the final crisis, the verse that you just read, Revelation 14, 12, is going to have a pulsating heart. And that heart is going to be the message of Jesus Christ, our righteousness. And I'm going to make that plain to you. Uh, I've got a quotation here. It's on a little brochure that we have at our booth. This is from an inspired pen, I believe. Uh, volume 6 of the Testimonies, page 19. It's right on the cover of our little brochure here. And this is what it says. In the days ahead, the law of God is to be magnified. Its claims must be presented in their true and sacred character that the people may be brought to decide for or against the truth. Yet the work will be cut short in righteousness. Now listen to this. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God which closes the work 
of the third angel's message. Does that uh, speak to your heart? It speaks to my heart that one of these days the message of Christ's righteousness is to sound. And that, that paragraph is really a comment upon this verse, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now let me explain this to you. I want to take your mind back to a fateful day, September 11, 2001. I think we all remember that day. Um, it was over 10 years ago when the Twin Towers came down in New York City. There's a lot of different ideas, speculation, opinions, interpretations about the significance of 911. Well, I'm going to share with you my take on what I see as the, uh, the biggest significance of that day and of that week and some very, very powerful lessons that we can learn today. Here's a quiz question for you. I often do this in front of my audiences. How many of you remember what day of the week September 11 fell on? Okay, Tuesday, that's right. It was a Tuesday morning. That's correct. Tuesday morning, the crisis hit. Tuesday morning, the stock market plummeted. Tuesday morning, fear rippled out across the world because people were very concerned that what happens to the financial center of the most powerful nation upon the earth could affect the global economy. And so it was a big day. I remember thinking to myself when I watched on live television, the first tower go down, the second tower go down, I thought to myself, wow, this is definitely an apocalyptic moment. So that was on a Tuesday. Three days later was what day? Three days later was a Friday. Now, I don't know if any of you watched on television, but the, that Friday, in, inside the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., there was a major, you could call it a church service, a gathering, a prayer service that took place uh, in the National Cathedral. It was televised live. There were, every living president was there, senators, congressmen, politicians, religious leaders from around the world. On the platform was Billy Graham, representing the Protestant world. Um, there was a rabbi representing Judaism. There was an imam representing Islam. There was, I don't know where the Pope was, but there was the Catholic Cardinal representing the Roman Catholic religion. And, there were, and all of these different leaders addressed the crowd, and basically what they said was, we need to pray. We need to come together and pray for unity and pray that God will do something to help America and the world in this crisis. How many of you watched that, that church service? Okay, quite a few of you did. Well, I watched that with great interest, and, uh, and I'm certainly in favor of prayer. People need to pray during a crisis. But as I watched that, I thought to myself, okay, this is very uh, significant. Tuesday, the crisis hit, and now Friday, three days later, is a very strong movement for unity. Now, two days later would be what day? Two days later was a Sunday. Can any of you think of anything significant, highly significant, that happened on the Sunday following the Tuesday when the towers came down? Okay, I heard somebody say it. Don't miss this. Church attendance in America and around the world went through the roof. People, there were more people in church the Sunday following September 11 that had been to church in a long, long time. And it wasn't just in America, it was in Australia. Uh, it was in Europe. Because people knew, people sensed something big is going on that could affect the global economy and people were quite frightened. So I looked at that and I watched this with great interest. I'm a student of the Bible, I'm looking at events taking place in the world and I, and I saw something that to me was just as clear as a bell and that was this. There was a crisis on Tuesday that was followed by a movement toward unity on Friday and that was followed by Sunday church attendance going through the roof around the world. And I thought about that, and the words just kept ringing in my ears. Crisis, unity, Sunday. Crisis, unity, Sunday. To me, that's very significant. Whenever a major crisis hits, the result is people are going to be going to church. You've heard the expression, there's no atheists in foxholes. Have you heard that expression? Well, the same thing happened during the week of 9-1-1. Now, it's no secret 
uh, to a lot of people in the world, even secular people, and especially those of us that are studying our Bibles, that we are on the edge of a much bigger crisis than what happened during the week of September 11. Isn't that right? The book of Daniel tells us in chapter 12, verse 1, that sometime in the future there will be a time of trouble such as never was, never was, ever since there's been a nation. There are many verses in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, lots of verses that tell us that we are on the edge of an overwhelming crisis. And it's going to be much bigger than the one that happened during the week of 911. We know that. Those of us who are studying our Bibles, we know that. Now, what is going to be the spark of that final global crisis that has been predicted in Bible prophecy? I don't know. I'm not a prophet. Uh, it could be a series of disasters, of natural disasters. It could be a gigantic solar storm. People are talking a lot about the power of the sun and these storms that could knock out the power grid. I'm not sure. Uh, it could be an economic meltdown, the collapse of the dollar. I don't know. Things are, I do know that things are being held together by a thread. How God is holding this world together is, is amazing how he can do it. It could be a well-placed a well terrorist attack on the, on, a compu on the computer system, the computer grid. I just don't know. But I do know that it's coming. And I also know that September 11 hit on a clear blue sky, out of a clear blue sky. People just weren't expecting this, and all of a sudden, wham, there it was. We woke up the next day or that day, and all of a sudden, we were in the midst of this. And something similar is going to happen at the end, the final end, when the final crisis hits. And I do know that just like what happened during the week of September 11, the same dynamics are going to be at work. There's no question about it. And to me, that's the big significance of what happened on September 11 that we're going to see once again. That was just like a little, a little window. It was, an, it was an example of what's coming in the future that we will see again crisis followed by unity or a move toward unity, and that will be followed by Sunday attendance around the world. It's just, it's not a mystery. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer. It's easy to figure out. It's easy to look at that and realize that that's going to happen. Now, if we get into another crisis, a big crisis, a final crisis that hits this world really hard, uh, during the week of September 11, the market went down, they stopped trading, but as time went on, the trading continued and the market came back, right? We got out of that crisis, didn't we? But what happens if another crisis hits and we don't get out of it? What happens if things get things start to spiral out of control and the crisis gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and there, there just seems to be no way out. What's going to happen then when that time comes, which it will? What will happen then? I, can, I don't know how much money you have. <laughs> it's a phrase. You can bet your bottom dollar. You may not have very many dollars, uh, but if you did have... A, you, you get my point. You can bet your bottom dollar that this is what will happen. That if we don't get out of this crisis, that eventually Sunday attendance, which we'll see again, is going to shift. It's going to shift in a crisis. It's going to shift in the midst of an hour of desperation. And it's going to shift to Sunday legislation. There are Sunday laws that are on the books now. If you do your homework in history. Uh, Sunday legislation has taken place in Europe. It's taken place in England. It's taken place in colonial America. Uh, there were strict blue laws during the time of the early colonies, and there is a movement today. I think about the uh, European Sunday Alliance. I think about the efforts of Pope Benedict XVI. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of people today that would like to see Sunday once again become legislated by law. And if we come into a final crisis, that's what's going to happen. Uh, we believe that's what Bible prophecy predicts, that that will happen. And it will happen as a result of people trying to come to God in a crisis and say, Lord, you've got to help us because if you don't do something, the planet is in peril. We've got to get out of this somehow, and only you can do it. 
And so Sunday attendance will shift to Sunday legislation and it will be done as an effort to try to bring America and the world back to God in a time of crisis, in an emergency measure. When you're in an emergency, forced, force must be used. And that, or at least that's what they think. That's what's going to happen. And those that don't go along with it, those that don't flock to church on the first day of the week, they're going to stick out like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego on the plains of Babylon. When everybody bowed down, and they were bowing down to the image of King Nebuchadnezzar, there were three people that said, our conscience tells us we can't do this. Our conscience tells us we can't do this. Now, what I'm sharing with you uh, may be a new idea to many of you. I'm not sure. I don't imagine that all of you here are completely familiar with this scenario. This may be a new idea to you. Uh, for those that watch this on television, the same thing. Uh, I'd like to share with you what Seventh-day Adventists believe is on the horizon. And I ask that you think about it, ponder it, pray about it, and take a look at it from the Bible. What's wrong with Sunday legislation anyway? It happened in Europe. Constantine did it. It's happened in British history, colonial American history. Uh, it happened, it's happened many times. What's wrong with Sunday legislation? If Sunday, if people are going to church we're in a crisis, they're praying, and the government says, you've got to go to church, we're in emergency, churches and governments unite around the world in, an, in a time of crisis, and so Sunday is enforced by law. What's wrong with that? Isn't that a good thing? There's two major things that are wrong with Sunday legislation. Number one is it's the wrong day. If you look at the Ten Commandments, the Big Ten, and if you go down one, two, three, four, and look at the Fourth Commandment, the Fourth Commandment tells us that what day is the Sabbath day. It's the seventh day, not the first day of the week. That's right. And so, first of all, what's wrong with it is it is the wrong day being enforced by law. It's not the day of the Ten Commandments. I think anybody with an open heart looks at the law of God will recognize that. Second problem with Sunday legislation, and somebody just tell me what it is. It's pretty obvious for those of us that have at least thought about it. Uh, Okay, that's right, that's right. It's the use of force. It's the use of force in religion. It's, gov it's government and churches trying to force people to be religious and to go to church. Jesus Christ never used force to compel obedience. He only used the power of love. He doesn't do that, so that's it. And when that time finally comes, and we're in a big crisis, and there's unity, and there's Sunday attendance, and then Sunday legislation, and it's happening around the world, and there's a whole lot of us that have a problem with this and think there's something wrong, it's the wrong day, it's force, and especially if we know our Bibles, if we know what Revelation 14 says, we know what the third angel's message says, that we're going to be in the time of the final crisis, and we have a message to give to the world. We, when that time comes, we need to be able to explain to our friends, to our families, to our neighbors, to reporters, to the media, what this crisis is all about, right? We need to be able to explain what's going on. I fully believe, by the grace of God, that White Horse Media is going to be operating at that time. This is the goal of our ministry. This is our dream to be a part of God's last message to the world. And I can guarantee you that if we are a functioning organization, when the final crisis hits around the world, we're going to send out press releases, which we've been doing in the past. We've learned how to engage the media. I've learned how to get on uh, television shows and radio shows as a guest. I don't know how many of you are local, but ha who of you have listened to Billy Cunningham on the big one, 700 AM WLW? How many of you are from Cincinnati, ever listen to Billy Cunningham? Anybody? You, got, you must all be from out of town. <laughs> Anybody that lives in Cincinnati is well aware of the uh, radio station, WLW 700 AM. It's the biggest one in Cincinnati. And one of the biggest talk show hosts out there is a man named Billy Cunningham. He's recently gone uh, with Fox News. He's got a national television show as well. I've been Billy's guest at least five times discussing different things. Uh, just about a week ago, I was a guest 
on the Rob Pratt Show, the Weekend Magazine with Rob Pratt. It's a CBS affiliate, KDKA station in Pittsburgh. That's a large station on the East Coast. Uh, I've been on all kinds of shows, hundreds and hundreds of shows. And we, we talk about all kinds of media issues. We talked about the Colorado murder massacre. That, massacre, that was the last program I was on uh, with, uh, with Rob Pratt. And when the crisis hits, we're going to send out a press release and try to engage the media. I hope to get on Fox News. I'd like to uh, have the producer of the Bill O'Reilly show contact me and say, Steve Wahlberg, uh, Bill would like to interview you about Sunday legislation and your views of Bible prophecy. I'd love to be on the no spin zone with Bill and to discuss this. Anyway, when this time finally comes, God is going to have a people around the world that are going to be getting on the radio, getting on television, talking to the reporters, talking to the newspapers, and they're going to be explaining what the Bible says about this final crisis. Are you ready for that time? Do you know what to say when the crisis hits? Well, we're going to open up our Bibles, and we all need to do this, back to Revelation 14. And we need to explain in a simple way, verse 9, who the beast is. We've got to do it. We're going to say what the image of the beast is. We're going to talk about the mark of the beast. We're going to explain that in a simple way. And then we're going to go down to verse 12, 14, 12, and we're going to say this verse. And let's say it together. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Right. And as the quote that I read earlier from sixth volume of the Testimonies, page 19, it says that the law of God is to be magnified. Its claims must be presented in their true and sacred character that the people may be brought to decide for or against the truth. When the final crisis hits, when we get on the radio and television and we're interviewed by these people, we need to open our Bibles. We need to read verse 12 that talks about those who keep the commandments of God. Let's just say that again. Keep the commandments of God. Now then what we're going to do is we're going to open up our Bibles to Exodus 20 and we're going to go down through the Ten Commandments one by one. And this is what's going to be happening all over the world. People are going to be opening their Bibles and telling people, let's look at the law of God. Let's look at the Big Ten that God wrote with his own finger on stone. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. That verse is going to be shared around the world. The second commandment, no idols. The third commandment, don't take God's name in vain. The fourth commandment, remember, don't forget the seventh day, the Sabbath, and keep it to keep it holy. The fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. Number six, don't murder. Number seven, don't commit adultery. Number eight, don't steal. Number nine, don't lie. Number ten, don't covet. And I strongly believe that when that time finally comes, the crisis hits, God's going to have people around the world that are directing people to his law. When that time finally comes, it will not be a time for marshmallow Christianity. It will not be a time for fluff. It will not be a time for side issues. It will not be a time for all kinds of uh, different interpretations about strange things that are blowing around the world. It's going to be a time when the fourth angel comes down from heaven, uniting with the third angel to direct people all over the planet to the holiness of the Big Ten, the Ten Commandments. Not the Ten Suggestions, but the Ten Commandments that God wrote with his own finger on stone that are summarized in the two big commandments to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. And I want to be a part of that. And, and I'm, I'm deeply convic- convicted that God can't use me to lift up his law, to magnify his law, if I'm breaking his law myself. The only way God can use me to really communicate uh, the importance of the Ten Commandments is if I am a commandment keeper. And so that's what's going to be happening. We're going to be lifting up the law around the world. Now, follow this thought. Don't miss this point. When we are in the midst of the final crisis, which we will be soon, and the mark of the beast is enforced by law around the world, which will happen, and God has a people that are lifting up the Ten Commandments, 
and showing people number one, number two, number three, number four, all ten of them, especially the fourth one, and the Holy Spirit is speaking with great power, and people's eyes are being opened, and they're going, whoa, I've never seen that before. And the finger that wrote the law is speaking to people's hearts, commandment by commandment, saying, this is my law. This is non-negotiable. God wrote it with his own finger on stone. When that time comes, and the world, at least those that are open, are convicted that they've broken the Ten Commandments, then what? Then what happens? Here's a, here's a few Bible verses. 1 John 3, 4 says, sin is breaking the law. We know that. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. Romans 3.19 and 20 says, the whole world will become guilty before God. 14.12 says, here are they that keep. Here's a very important point. Don't miss this point. Before anyone becomes a commandment keeper, they first must realize that they are, they are what? They're a commandment breaker. That's right. And if God has people around the world that are lifting up his law and showing people that they've broken all the different commandments and the fourth commandment's being broken and the Holy Spirit is speaking with power to human hearts, impressing people, people realize that they're guilty, that they're sinners, that they've broken God's law, his moral law, then what? Then what? Do we just tell people, do I go, go to Bill O'Reilly or Billy Cunningham and say, Billy or Bill or Rob or whatever show I'm on, uh, really the fourth commandment points to the seventh day, not the first day of the week, and if you'll just shift days from the first day of the week to the seventh day, everything's fine. You'll go to heaven that way. Is that what we're supposed to say during the final crisis? No. Don't miss this. When the law of God is lifted up, as this quote says, magnified, and its claims are presented in their true and sacred character that the people may be brought to decide for or against the truth, when that time comes all around the world and the Spirit of God is trying to convict people one last time, and the world feels its need at least those that are open, that they're guilty of breaking the law of God, don't miss this. That moment is going to become heaven's finest hour. That moment is going to be the moment when the greatest light that has ever burst upon this world is going to flash from sea to sea, from shore to shore, all around the world. It is in the midst of that final crisis hour that God's people, through the power of the Holy Spirit, are going to lift up, lift up, higher and higher and higher. One man and all eyes are going to be directed to one man, to one man. And it's not going to be Steve Wahlberg. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but it's not going to be Doug Batchelor. It's not going to be Mark Finley. It's not going to be... Uh, any one of those that the Lord is using. It's not going to be you. It's not going to be Danny or Jim or any of us because as uh, Danny Shelton so often correctly says, it's not about us, right? It's not about me. Who's it about? It's about Jesus, that's right. And in the final crisis, listen to what she says. The same quote, after the law of God is magnified, it says, the message of Christ's righteousness is to sound. From one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God which closes the work of the third angel. When the Ten Commandments are lifted up and people realize that they're sinners, which is the first half of verse 12, the commandments of God, then the next half of verse 12 is going to be lifted up higher and higher and higher and higher, and people are going to look at Jesus, and they're going to be told, John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
that 2,000 years ago, a baby was born in Bethlehem. 2,000 years ago, he came down. The one whose finger wrote the law came down and became a, a baby and became a man. And during 33 years of living, walking the dusty roads of Galilee, the shores of Judea, for 33 years, a man named Jesus Christ, a God-man, kept every single one of those commandments perfectly. He kept the Sabbath, as Luke 4, 16 says. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, stood up to read. He kept the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, when he was subject to Joseph and Mary in Luke 2, when he resisted the devil in the wilderness and said, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He kept the first commandment and put his father first. When he said, I tell you the truth, he never lied. He kept the ninth commandment. He didn't bear false witness. Jesus Christ kept every single one of the Ten Commandments perfectly from birth to grave. And who did he do it for? He did it for you and for me. That's right. Uh, Jeremiah 23, verse 5 and 6 says that Jesus is going to have a special name, and the name is the Lord, our righteousness. If you read your Bibles, you'll, you'll discover Romans 9, 31, Romans 8, 4, that God's law, his Ten Commandments, is a law of righteousness. It tells us what's right and what's wrong. It tells us it's wrong to lie, it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to commit adultery. It's wrong not to honor our parents. It's wrong not to keep the Sabbath. It's wrong to bow down to idols. God has a law. He has a standard of right and wrong. It's non-negotiable. It doesn't change. No matter what the world says, God's Big Ten stand today. It's a law of righteousness showing us what's right and what's wrong. And the good news is that Jesus Christ came down here as a man and he kept every single one of those commandments. He loved his father with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. He loved his neighbor as himself. He kept the law of God perfectly and he earned the right to become the Lord, our righteousness. And then at the end of 33 years of holy living in the Garden of Gethsemane, he suffered and he agonized and he drank a cup. I don't have time to develop this right now, but the third angel's message says that those that get the mark of the beast will eventually drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out into a cup. That's what Revelation 14 says, 10 says in your Bible. And I am deeply convicted that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ drank that cup. He trembled with that cup. The, the destiny of the human race trembled in that trying hour. And Jesus drank that cup and he said, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He took our justice so he could give us his mercy. He took the wrath of the third angel's message, the just wrath of God. He took it in his own mind and in his own heart. He loves us more than we'll know. And during the final crisis, we lift up the Ten Commandments and then we lift up Jesus. He's our righteousness. At the end of his life, he took, he gathered to himself the sins of the whole world. All the commandment breaking that you've ever done, that I've ever done, that every religion has done, whether it's Catholic or Baptist or Wiccan or Muslim or Jewish, whatever it is, all the Ten Commandments that have been broken all over the world, all the sin was gathered and placed in the mind and in the heart of Jesus Christ. And he paid, he suffered, and he agonized, and he drank that cup in Gethsemane on the cross, and he died. He died for you and for me and for the whole world. And during the final crisis, that needs to be, that cry, the loud cry, needs to be lifted up. Jesus needs to be lifted up higher and higher and higher. The finger that wrote the law was on a hand that was nailed to a cross. Two mountains, Mount Sinai, where he gave his law, Mount Calvary, where he paid the price. The heart of the third angel's message, the commandments of God, the faith of Jesus, the law, the gospel, these truths come together in the final crisis. The law is lifted up and the cross is lifted up and Jesus Christ is lifted up. He's my righteousness. He's my savior. He loves me. He suffered for me. He took all my sins. He died for me, and he rose from the dead. And he offers me and he offers you 
a pure white robe of perfect righteousness to cover all of our sins. And that message must be preached during the final crisis with tremendous power, with latter rain, Holy Ghost power like we've never seen, because that's it. I mean, that's the bottom line. People have broken God's law, and they need a Savior. They need Jesus. This is not a side message. This is not a rabbit trail. This is not a, uh, one of the devil's diversions. It's the final message of God to the world as described in the Bible. It's the third angel's message. It's right there in Scripture. And those that hear the message during that final time, they'll have to make a final choice. And they'll have to respond. They'll know they're guilty. They've broken the law. There's a law enforcing the wrong day. Now they see the right law. They see the right day. And they see the right man, the right Savior who is their righteousness, who loves them, who paid the price, whose arms are open, and who says, come to me right now. This is your last chance. This is your last chance. This is it. And those that make the right choice and yield to Jesus as their Savior, trust Him as their righteousness, they will be forgiven. They'll be clothed with a white robe. They'll have the Holy Spirit coming into their hearts with power and he will write that law in their hearts. The finger that wrote the law was nailed to a cross and then that same finger will write the law in their hearts and in their minds. And then by the grace of God, they will then become commandment keepers. Like this verse says, here are they that keep. First they know they've broken and then they know they need Jesus. And then they become those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Commandment keepers will be born during that final crisis. And I want to be one of those people. I want to be a commandment keeper. Don't you? Uh, I'll tell you a, a quick story. Um, actually, let me show you. Uh, most of you know that a few months from now, a very fateful day is coming, December 21, 2012. I've written a book about this, 2012 at the end of the world. If you happen to watch this program on television after that date has passed, uh, then you'll have to find another book to share as a missionary book. But I've written a little book on this. We've got it at our booth, and it talks about December 21, the date when the mind calendar comes to an end, and all the speculation about this. And, uh, and it's got the third angel's message right in it. It's got the Ten Commandments in it. It's got Jesus in it, the gospel in it, his law, and his love is in it. And anyway, I bring out in my book, uh, and I've done this on the radio many times, and I'll do it again as we get closer to December 21, that I personally believe that December 21, 2012 is going to be a very significant day. Something big is going to happen on that day. And you're, you're wondering, what are you talking about? Well, I'll tell you. December 21, 2012, my little girl, her name is Abby, Abigail Rose Wahlberg, she will turn five on that day. <laughs> December 21, 2012 is her birthday. To me, that's the only significance of the day. <laughs> anyway, uh, last December, right around December 21, we had a birthday for Abby and she, when she turned four. We had some church friends in our home. Uh, grandma and Grandpa were there, and, and uh, Abby had a little stack of presents. And Grandma and Grandpa had bought her this big present. It was gigantic, bigger than my daughter. And it was a dollhouse. And I'll confess to you that I do play with dolls sometimes when my little girl grabs my hand and says, Daddy, will you play with me in my dollhouse? She's hard to resist. Well, she didn't know she had a, uh, a dollhouse in this big box. So we all got around and time came, opened the presents, and she pulled off, she pulled off the wrapper and she looked and she saw this big image of a gigantic dollhouse in this box. And she was so shocked to see this. And she looked at it and she looked at Grandma and Grandpa and this is what she said. It was so moving to me. She looked at, at them and she said, she said, Grandpa, is this really for me? Is this really for me? And of course, they looked at her and said, yes, honey, this is, this is all for you. This is all for you. Well, I want to tell you, and we need to be saying this with a loud voice all around the world, especially during the final crisis, that 2,000 years ago, God came down and became a man. Was that all for you? It was. 2,000 years ago, 
for 33 years, <clears throat> Jesus Christ kept the Ten Commandments perfectly with love in his heart, unselfish love, to become the Lord our righteousness, your righteousness and mine, because we haven't done it. Did he do that all just for you? At the end of his life in Gethsemane, he wrestled, Father, is it, if it's possible, take this cup from me. But it wasn't possible if we were to be saved. So Jesus chose to drink that cup, to take the justice so we could receive his mercy. Did he do all of that? Was he separated from his Father in Gethsemane and on the cross all for you? Yes. And then he finally stretched out his arms and he said, it is finished. And he died. Was that all for you? Yes, it was. And then he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. It was all for you and it was all for me. And that's what we need to preach. The message of Christ our righteousness during earth's final crisis with a loud voice through the power of the Holy Spirit so that this verse is fulfilled and God has a people all around the world who are among the saints. Here are they that keep because they love him for what he's done for them. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And when that people is fully formed and everyone makes their choice, then the door in heaven will close, the plagues will fall, those that make the right choice who are on Jesus' side will be protected during the final crisis, the final time of plagues, and then the sky will crack open and the Son of God will come down to get his people who are his saints, who love him, who want him, who've given him their whole lives and say, Lord, get me out of here. And it'll be the greatest airlift in the history of humanity. And we'll be going up to glory Hallelujah, and we won't have any more ASI conventions. <laughs> May God hasten that day. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear Father, Holy Father in heaven, thank you for the message of the third angel, the message of Jesus Christ and his righteousness, how much Jesus loves us, how much he's done for us. Oh, Lord, thank you so much. Please be with all of us. Write your law in our hearts. Put your love inside of us and help us to love you, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to be commandment keepers in the midst of a lost world so that light, that gray light, that people will go, whoa, look at that light. I've never seen it like that before. It'll be shining around the world. May we be a part of that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.